everybody. Welcome to another edition of Paranormal Crypto Rabbit Hose. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Mr. Decker. How hey, are hey, you hey. How's everybody doing? Doing all right, man. It is a hot, muggy night up here in the mountains, I tell you what. Hello, Nicole. How are you doing? Yes, Yolanda. Everybody's starting to filter in. Aussie Sue, yep. keeper of true crime and paranormal. Welcome. Roger Blair. Yes, Aussie Sue. Roger. Yeah. So, what we got cooking tonight, Mr. Decker? Well, good news and bad news, guys. Bad news is our guest, Nate Brisbane, tonight had to cancel last minute. He came down with some sick. Um, so, unfortunately, the, the pale crawler discussion is on hold. But, good news is I've got my good friend Chris Deems from Country Conversations up here. He has an excellent podcast. He agreed to come on and chew the fat with us tonight and see what we can get into. What? Yeah. Whoa, we got Chris. What? Ow, yes, come on down, Chris. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. How y'all doing? <laughs> Welcome to the party, man. Hey, hey, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. Wow, this is a pleasure. Yeah. Hey, it's warm and muggy yeah. here up, up in West Virginia, too, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> nice yeah, it's, it's... So introduce yourself and tell everybody uh, all about you. Well, I uh, I started a show. It's been almost a year. It was Country Boy Crimson, but then I changed it to Country Boy Conversation. Uh, I've lived in more uh, West Virginia all my life. Always been into Bigfoot, Bigfoot and paranormal. Well, ever since I was a little kid, you know. And then I guess just later on in life, I really started getting into it. So I just I just usually have guests on and we talk, you know, about different topics and stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's about all I can say. <laughs> so what got you into the Bigfoot world? You know, to, for me, I really think it was uh, the $6 million man with Andre the Giant playing Bigfoot. I really think that's what did it, you know what I mean? And then, of course, reading, the, reading all the books, you know, when you're a kid about Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot, mm-hmm. and you know, all that. I it just, I don't know, it just kind of stuck with me, you know. Uh, I, I've always been interested in all that stuff. Anything weird. I like history anyway, so. It's yeah, we're getting, a, we're getting a little feedback. You got another app open or something? No, I don't. No, I have no, nothing open. Yeah, testing, testing. Yeah, we're getting a little feedback there. Uh, Facebook, YouTube open or anything? No, the only thing I have open is StreamYard. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's strange. We'll roll unless with it. it. Unless it's my internet. <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's getting... Uh, even when you talk, it's getting feedback too. It's, just, it's like we're hearing each other twice. Right. Yeah. yeah I'm I on it. my side. Yeah, I'm. I'm hearing it too. Yeah, I got the TV off. I got everything off. I got my phone on. That's it. But it's turned down. And <laughs> all right. Well, we'll bear with it. And and I'm just glad to have you on a short notice. Thank you. No so problem. six million dollar man, a lot of people don't remember that. I do. Oh man, I love that show. Oh yeah, yeah. That was the Lee Majors has always been a good. I mean, I love the six million dollar man. And voila, there he went. So <laughs> hmm. there it goes. Uh, you know, I think a lot of us first got introduced to that kind of stuff, the paranormal, just from regular TV. I mean. Where I was at, I didn't get introduced to it, but we didn't have American television. You know, I didn't catch a hold of that until we came to the States. But I can remember uh, watching documentaries on Loch Ness or stuff like that the few times we'd come to the States, and I was always just hooked. Didn't matter what it was, I was watching it, you know? Right, right. And I, I think that's where a lot of people actually 
Um, uh, maybe it's me getting the echo. Is it me, guys, or was it him? You sound pretty clear. He's the only one that sounded fuzzy was on his side. But I, I think the the television is what got us hooked on a lot of things. Yeah. Are you using your Bluetooth tonight? Are you using your Bluetooth or your stereo system? On uh, my stereo, just like I did last week. Ah. Are you catching it from that side? Because that's all I usually do when I don't got my Bluetooth. Well, we're just sitting talking to Chris, and he's like, Bluetooth. <laughs> yeah, just, it just oh. went all the way out. Yeah, that's what oh, he said. We didn't even start talking yet. Right. So yeah. So, but um, I, I, we were saying, I think we all gotten into the paranormal uh, mm -hmm. watching TV. I think that's oh, yeah. how we all got started. I really do. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm right there with you, Grizzly. I really think that's what got a lot of people started was TV, and of course the Patterson Gimblin film. You know. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. That too. You know that re that really did it. You know. But. uh but the $6 million man, you know, had Bigfoot on it. So it's that's okay. Like here's, that. here's a rabbit hole we can go down just off of that now, right? So what do you guys think about the idea of the media, like, presenting information to us ahead of time to, to soften us up so when it comes out to disclosure, we're ready for it, okay? So we'll think about that, right? So horror movies, talking Bigfoot, aliens, all that kind of stuff, and kind of prepping us to, to be able to handle that kind of stuff, right? So let's think what's going on right now with the government um, acknowledging UFOs and aliens and all this kind of stuff. Do you think a lot of the mainstream movies were kind of designed and developed to soften us, to get us ready to handle that kind of information? And how long has it been going on? Uh, I think you're 100 percent correct. I, I think this. I think the UFO, the whole UFO thing, goes back to Roswell. I really think that's you know the the beginning of when they started softening this up for this stuff. Um, and the Patterson Gimblin film for Bigfoot, you, you know the picture, you know, and, and yeah, it's. I think it softened us up. I mean, we don't had to hear them to come out and say, yeah, there's UFOs. But look, did people go crazy? Did they run amok? And you know, well, no. It was just like it was another day, because most of us done kind of knew, you know, that yeah, they're real, you know. <clears throat> yeah. So I found the culprit. I I know where the echo's coming from. I muted Decker's mic. Is it, <laughs> is it my side? <laughs> Yes, it is. So, uh, yeah. So I muted, I muted uh, your mic when Chris was talking. I was like, I got gotcha. you. But, <laughs> okay. uh, but no. But, but I believe, I believe what Chris is saying because if we look at Independence Day, that movie oh, was yeah. scrubbed twelve or thirteen times before it was released mm -hmm. to the public. Now, why in the world was the government involved in scrubbing that movie? Now, I always said to people when they ask me that question, right, Chris, is that mm -hmm. if you're a whistleblower, you're not going to be on TV going, yeah, aliens exist and we right, have technology. Right. You're not going to be like this. You're going to be like, yeah. uh, I, I don't want to show my face. I want, I want my voice changed. And, you know, exactly. you're not going to be happy. I mean, I always, I always think, and I do believe, that the government have sent these people and they're like, this is what you're going to tell the world, okay? And this is mm -hmm. how you're going to tell them. And they're all excited because I am going to be the whistleblower who's going to tell you that what I'm going to tell what the government told me to tell you, in which we already mm -hmm. knew. Yeah, and and yeah, that's the sad thing about it. We already knew about it, you know? I mean, they, they told us during... And I can't say the C word because we get, because we get blacklisted on one channel. But the <laughs> pandemic, remember mm -hmm. when we all were inside for whenever? Uh, they they announced it, and everybody mm -hmm. was like, Yep, nobody even paid attention. It's like, right. Yeah, okay, so what? And I was mm -hmm. like, 
uh, did anybody else catch that? <laughs> and everybody just like nothing happened. I'm like, they just yeah. said it, you know, and even during one of my trailers, you know, oh my God, look, it's going against the wind, you know? And, you know, <laughs> it, it's always been out there and, you know, you just like the guy holding up the Roswell, the, the weather balloon. I mean, even in the photograph, he's looking at the camera like, you are so full of BS. You're making me do this, really? <laughs> I mean, his facial expressions is like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not like, hey, look, guys, you're wrong. It's like. Right. You know, <laughs> uh, really? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, look, look who just tuned in. So Russ Collette, he is the UFO expert from oh. UK. He is an abductee. So he, he, he films, and I do a show with him on Monday. He knows about flying triangles, UFO. Man, I'm telling you, man, he has got evidence. He's been on BBC. He's been in magazines. He's been on all kinds of stuff. He knows. And he's been doing this for 30 something years. And I mean, they we all know. I mean, Chris, what is your take? I mean, I think everybody knows. I mean, honestly, I mean, this look, uh, this, this, by just for an example, this was on the road. The, uh, I, I found this the other day. Police in the Amazon jungle are probing bizarre claims of just being menaced by creatures like the predator. This is um, from the Amazon jungle, and it's the Iku, Ikitu indigenous people of Alto Nene, northwest of Lima. This just come out not long ago, you know. So, I mean, yeah. what, what reason would a tribe like that lie i mean it makes this stuff up it doesn't make any sense i mean they're they don't know that much about our culture i'm sure you know like I don't know if they get tv down there or whatever uh maybe you can answer that justin i mean you you kind of <laughs> grew up in the jungle down that way a little bit yeah well i mean that would all depend on how remote they were you know because um mm -hmm. i mean there's plenty of towns and then villages and stuff down there that are somewhat civilized. They do have access to television and stuff like that, you know. Um, so it would all just kind of depend on where they're at in their society and all that. Because, I mean, like right. with the tribe I lived right. with, there, there was no such thing as, even we didn't have a TV out there. There was no way to, to use one, you know. Right, right. But the, the interesting thing with what you're talking about is what we now refer to as the Glimmer Man, you know. Yeah. And... Yep. I've got a yep. research partner up here that has experienced the Glimmer Man phenomenon for himself. And he's, I'm going to have him come on the show one of these nights, and we're going to talk about it. But him and, and the team he was with experienced an encounter with something. He won't say what it was because he doesn't know, and that's the kind of researcher he is. But he'll, he'll uh -huh. describe it to you how it was exactly like the Predator in the movie. It, it was a shimmery humanoid figure that they could see right through but it looked like a heat wave and that's exactly what he experienced up here in Appalachia yeah um actually I was watching a documentary and I can't remember the name of it or who did it but it was about a woman that lived in Ohio and you know there's lots of big fields in Ohio and then and then there's like there'll be a patch of woods you know what I mean in, in, in the middle of the field or off to the side well she was bow hunting and she seen something similar to that too. She said she couldn't tell what it was, but she could see a figure. But it was like you could see through it. You know what I mean? It, it, it was like, like the glimmer man. You know, like the glimmer man effect that you're talking about. And I, I, I know that cool. story. That is considered to be the first reputable person to disclose this encounter. If I remember correctly, she is the wife of um, a big UFO researcher. Um, I believe he's with MUFON, and he has like a PhD. I can't remember their names off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. But, um, and they actually caught some images on film, 
of, of what was going on. And I believe this was back in, oh man, I want to say the early nineties when, yeah, when they, yeah. when it happened and nobody talked about it because it was one of those things where that wasn't even on anybody's radar yet, you know? Right, right. And, and so they didn't tell anybody. It was just one of those things that they just kind of kept to themselves until it started coming out and people started talking about it. And then they were comfortable saying, Hey, actually we experienced this here back when, and here's some, some photographs of it. And yeah, I remember hearing, I didn't see the documentary, but I remember hearing that story and it's well, considered to be yeah. the first reputable encounter with the glimmer man, as far as chronologically speaking. Ah, yeah. I got that Trump. So oh. Marv shoot. Yep. In 2014, actually, by accident, videotape Glimmer Man. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> now, we actually showed the video on my show many times. It, 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 it scared me so bad, I do not go in the woods alone anymore. Cherokee tribes have told me, White man, you do not go in woods alone. Okay. Now, and I'm gonna poll what she captured it. I don't know why I have one. <laughs> and she's got it on her YouTube channel. She got it off of an i uh what do you call this? It's not a, a, a iPod. She mm -hmm. had it duct tape to a walking stick. And she was out with a group of people on her land. And if you watch the video, you see it look like a flash of light, like something walked. And you saw like a shadow. And she's like, what was that? And they're like, what? And they didn't, she didn't know what she got, but what she recorded. So they went back. And they put it up on the big screen because she said she saw something, but she didn't know what it was. And when they went back and watched the video, they were like, what in the world is this? Oh, wow. It looked like out of the movie Predator. Ladies and gentlemen, Standing Stones, Yolanda, whoever's in here has watched that video can tell you. We play that video over and over. People from Hollywood took her iPod and tried to debunk it like she faked it. They could not replicate it. They said that they, they, she did not have the technology back then for 2014, 2015. They said it was some kind of leaf. They thought it was an alien. So they went back and they slowed it down. And look, Yolanda says, I remember. And they went back and they slowed this this video down, I guess, because somebody was in production or whatnot, or I don't know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they saw hands. And it was Bigfoot hands. And it was grabbing the vegetation. So allegedly, two Bigfoot came out of a portal. That's why they saw this flash of light in the background and the shadow. Oh, so. Wow. They went back to the area. They saw tracks where this thing was. They actually have tracks. So they put two nice. and two together. And, it, and it, so allegedly it was a Bigfoot that cloaked. And they don't know if it, if it came back was like, what the hell are you doing? You know, checking them out or whatnot. But, man, if, if I had permission to show this video, I would love to show this video right now because, I mean, it, I mean, I mean, it is crazy. Is how many times have we heard Nicole remembers, too? Because people were like, what? Because, I mean, how many times have we heard, you know, I'm, I'm out in the woods, I hear something running, and I feel the ground shaking, and I don't see nothing. I hear yeah. something, but I don't see anything. So, you know, it makes you wonder, you know. Hello, Angel Light. You know, um, that reminds me of another incident, and I think it's a separate one from what you're talking about there, Chris. Um, uh -huh. Somebody was out on a Bigfoot expedition, 
and they visually saw what they believed was a juvenile Sasquatch come down out of a tree and kind of run across and disappear into the woods. And if I remember correctly, uh, the late Claudia Ockley was, was part of this group. And when they reviewed it, and they got it on camera, but when they reviewed it on camera, all they got was the glimmer man effect, where wow. visually they saw a, a juvenile Bigfoot, like I said, descend from the tree and run across the field of vision. And when they went back and replayed it, all they got was the glimmer man effect. They could see the, the shimmering movement of right where this thing was, but they did not actually capture the creature on video. Oh, wow. Well, let's, I mean, yep. do, do, Thanks, do you think, do you, do you, let's go down this rabbit hole then. Do you think that this glimmer man is something from another dimension? Or do you think it's a way for Bigfoot or dog man or, or, or whatever to cloak itself? Or what's your guys' thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, the only uh, person I've ever talked to in person that has experienced that is my buddy, the research partner, Lloyd. And mm -hmm. his dis what, what he described happening was when they saw this thing, it ascended straight up. Okay? Oh, wow. Now, okay. it wasn't climbing a tree straight up. It wasn't jumping. He said it was like somebody had a, a pulley rope attached to him, and it literally just went straight up. You know, and so, so to me, that's not a Bigfoot thing. That's not, you know, anything else. Like, how, how can that happen? So I think there might be, and I know people get tired of hearing this because I say it all the time. There could be multiple things that we're experiencing that has this effect, you know, because um, uh, years back, there was a book came out. I, I think it was something called like Chameleon or something like that, where it, it talked about, um, um, like, like him experiencing technology through the military that allowed people to cloak and they were stalking him, uh, using this cloaking technology and all this kind of stuff. So, okay. I mean, there, there okay. could be multiple things people are experiencing, right? I, I read a, an encounter of a lady just sitting in on her balcony in her apartment, like in a big city and noticed a shimmering glimmer man effect across the, the road and like this park that, that was across from our house, you know? Uh, so I'm not uh, wondering if it's a case of, okay, so how's this for a rabbit hole? The government has captured these creatures, right? And has experimented on them and know what's going on. Could they have possibly developed a cloaking tech based off, you know, Bigfoot's ability to do this cloaking thing? Uh, how, so, how's that for a concept, you know? So we have for a fact, and I published in, 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 in my Facebook group, that in mm -hmm. 2006, and Russ is going to say, we, in 2006, the government mm -hmm. announced that we have technology to make a goldfish and a rabbit disappear. And they demonstrated yep. that. So mm -hmm. now, if they came out in 2006 and, and demonstrated that technology, and we're using that on ships and tanks, right? Now, how long prior did they have that technology before they released that to the public? Oh, oh yeah. So, so think probably about it. Probably the 60s or 70s, at least. At least. Yeah. That, yeah. If not earlier. So. I mean, I mean, I think Star Trek was another one of them shows that kind of you know put the ufo along you know what i mean it, it yeah it, it, it it's something that they conditioned it this way star trek uh, star wars i mean there's so many sci-fi programs you know Battlestar galactica i remember watching it uh buck rogers when i yeah mm -hmm. right. you know, right they've been they, they just conditioned this and conditioned this on, on all this stuff uh oh, uh, Chris is teleporting uh, himself back and forth. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We we see a picture of you instead of your actual Turn video. Your camera. Yeah, yeah, my camera you, must have went off. But, Angel uh, of but, Light. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Angel of Light was asking a three-part question in there. I think the rest of it kind of got lost, but um, he was asking about a specific video of seeing a man and his wife being attacked by a Glimmer Man creature, but now he can't find it on YouTube anywhere. Oh, um, no. I have not seen or heard that video at all, man, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if you can't find it because in my research on some of these shows, things I had no I have seen and found and read I go back and try and find them using keywords, and I can't find anything on the topic. So no, it wouldn't surprise no. me if it was one of the things that got erased. Yeah. Now, yeah. we brought this up on one of the other shows. I, I don't, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I got a bad memory. Uh, within the last 7 to 11 years, the government has been, I have to start using, like Russ says, G-Man. Okay? I got to be careful because we are being monitored. G-Man uh, have been scrubbing the internet. Even that one site where you go back and, and you can validate the origination, the alterations, mm -hmm. and who made the changes and all that, that is being scrubbed. Uh, because just like when I went back and looked at the Martin case and the Appalachian Trail, uh, when I mm -hmm. was talking about the Barrelman, uh, on, on that case, uh, see, Russ is saying that's right. And yep. uh, that narrative has changed since last yep. year because I was like, what? I'm like, that is not what I just read last year because mm -hmm. like, everybody's like, what are you talking about, Grizzly? I'm like, because when they sent the Green Beret in, they said on this document that I'm reading now, it said they had no guns. And I'm like, why in the oh, world no. would you put in there they had no guns? Guns. Now, wait a minute, no. ladies and gentlemen. I always tell people, you always listen to what people tell you because they uh -huh. tell you what they want you to know. Mm -hmm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when Green Berets go in somewhere, they go <laughs> in armed, ladies and gentlemen. Now, yeah, they send the Guardian, okay? Now, yeah. they're not going to send in the Green Berets, not with nothing. Right. When, yeah. You know, when they said the Green Berets went in and they were not armed, that tells me they were armed. So they 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 secluded that, but put that that sentence in. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, because people were questioning. Wait a minute, we're looking for a missing child. Why is number one the National Guard involved, and then number two, why is the Green Berets called in? Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of questions around that, but it was weird how that story changed. So yes, it is being scrubbed and it is being altered. So, and, you know, and unfortunately with the technology and Chris, you can probably help me out. We can fabricate our own evidence and print it out and make it look like it's real. And we, nobody's going to know the difference. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so amazing. now with AI, it's really going to get bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the bad thing. That, that's only making things so much worse. Yeah. And, and uh, I think Decker and I was talking about this and some other guys I do shows with. It's anymore, unless we really know you, I feel sorry for people with video evidence and, and photograph mm -hmm. evidence. Because uh, we got to take and tread lightly with it because, I mean, people right now with hoaxes and fabricating, you know, stuff. I I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, there there's so many people out there who's like, ha -ha, look at this. I'm going to fool yeah. Chris and, and Decker mm -hmm. and them and, and make this up and, and pass this and see if I can. And people are actually are doing it right now and, and seeing how far yep. they can go with AI. And people are yep. like, man, look at this picture. Look, I can't believe they got the, and, and, and we're looking at it. And we're like, well, I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I didn't take the picture or video. So I can't tell you. I don't know. I haven't seen any convincing AI photos for me yet. Like every one that I've seen, I've been able to look at and go, yeah, that's not real. It just, I mean, I can just tell. Like it doesn't look real. It looks computer generated. It looks like CGI. Very well done CGI, sure, absolutely, right? But at the same time, like, nowadays we're starting to find out, right? So um, what do they say, like, like fingers and toes, AI can't draw very well or, or something like that at this point? And that's obviously going to change, right? They're going to correct that. 
as they find out where these errors are. But even at this point, it's like looking at a doctored photo. Most, not, not everybody, but a lot of people can look at a photo that's been like artificially aged. And unless it's done professionally, um, by like people that actually know what the heck's going on, you can usually tell it's kind of doctored up. There's things you, you could look for, you know, uh, Chris, it's like looking at a fake ID, right? To the layman, a fake ID might be very easily passed off, but if you yeah. know what you're looking yeah. for, there's little key things that can clue you in that it's a fake ID. When I worked right. in casinos, yeah. I had to learn how to spot fake driver's license and fake IDs, you know? Yeah. We, and, we had special tools that would identify fake IDs without sure. even have to screen your eyes, but yes. There you go. But looking yeah. at all these pictures yeah. that have made the rounds, I mean, I've never once looked at one and said, man, that might be a real one. Not once with these AI mm -hmm. photos going around, you know? They just don't. Yeah. But with people that don't know, right? That's right. new, there's, and they're like, right? Whoa. There's the problem. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so, exactly. Yeah, you know, sure. it, it's not like the old days where you're like, oh, look, look, look at the pixelation. Uh -huh. It's been cropped and and cut. You know, it's not like the old yep. days where you can just look at it. So yeah, I mean, I still think the Patterson Gimlin film. It's probably the best picture we're that we have and yep. will have right now. I mean, there's no denying that picture. I mean, MK Davis has no. broke that picture down to just. I mean, you can't get it any better. You know, what I mean, than what he did with it. Uh, he yeah. also had one of the uh, up in Siberia. He got a picture of a Bigfoot that he had, you know, zoomed in on and did all this stuff. And I'm telling you, it is awesome and i can't remember the name of the picture which one it was but man was it awesome is that like, the one in the snow field where where it looks like it's yeah, the trees and it's picking up snow yeah yes it's awesome yep. i mean it's it's just it's it's an awesome picture i mean i've, I've besides the patterson gimlin film you know that's probably my next favorite one yeah, uh, wow. uh, MK does some amazing work. I won't deny that at all. I don't necessarily uh, agree with some of the conclusions he draws from what he sees, but yeah, you know, yeah. I'm not. Uh, that's okay. I mean, he can look at his evidence and come to his conclusions and theories, and I come yeah. to mine, and then that's fine. I don't take issue with that. You know what I mean? His work, what he does with the stabilization of the videos and the clarity, is absolutely impeccable, and I would never ever say otherwise. You know what I mean? Um, and I agree. The work they did on the Patterson Gimlin film to stabilize it and then to clear it up is absolutely was groundbreaking in our field, I think. I really do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully someday we'll get a, a better one. But right now, I think that's what we're stuck with. Uh, well, I, I've I been think... asking people, is anybody out there right now working with the same camera that they used on that film, you know? And I. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's really trying it hard enough or this ain't been in the right place at the right time. You know. Well, I think a lot of the issue now is technology-based because back then um, it was film. And film cameras work different than digital cameras. They really do. The way they operate, everything is a little different. And so I personally believe that the film pictures, the film videos, the things that were on actual physical film were a much better quality than anything we're going to get now in the digital mm -hmm. realm. I yeah. really think that's a big hang up. Now people are still getting some pretty clear pictures um, and, and trail cam pics like that. A lot of them are not being shared publicly. Right. You know, I've right. gotten a couple that I thought were really, really good sent to me. I can't, you know, again, I wasn't there. I didn't take the picture. I didn't experience it. But most right. people that have quality pictures, for one, aren't putting them out there. Uh, right. They're afraid of the ridicule. They're afraid of the backlash. And when they do report it, they disappear so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, again, mm -hmm. again, going back to people not wanting to, to put this stuff out there um, and then making stuff disappear when it does get out there. So, you know, I've heard of devices getting erased and pictures disappearing off of computers and stuff, um, specifically for that reason, you know? Yeah, and you know that you know 
people can say, oh, Bigfoot's not real, you know, this or that. Why is the National Forest, some places, some states, putting out flyers, you know, about Bigfoot being right. in the in the campgrounds of uh, Florida? Yeah. Uh, I think California, one of the places out there, just put up not too long ago a warning about Bigfoot being in the, in the National Forest. So, yep. I mean... I just said it, it baffles my mind why they, they just don't come out. I mean, I know it's going to kill the logging industry, you know, and stuff like that. So. But, well, I mean, we got enough woods to last forever. I mean, they, they replant, you know, what they cut down and stuff. But I think the, their hood's so good that, but, uh, I don't think you'll ever really, you know, find them. If they don't want to be found, you're not going to find it. You know, I mean, no. And I mean, I don't know about on your what you guys think, but the last few years, it's just the 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 spottings and encounters have probably increased what threefold or more. Yeah, and, it, it, uh, it's really it's, increased. It's really increasing more and more and more. I mean, well, especially with Bigfoot, I, and I then then you know you got the, that. Go ahead. I was going to say dog man's another one, you know, it's just increasing and increasing. Yeah. I, I think a big part of that is we're, we're seeing again a resurgence of people getting out into the natural world, right? So for right. a long time, we, right. we became so industrial that we lost our connection to the woods and people weren't coming out. But I think nowadays, after the past several years of people being cooped up and then not being able to get out the way they wanted to. Now people are making a rush to get out to the wild spots again. I really think they are. Um, oh, yeah. I'm seeing it here in the Smoky Mountains, right? Smoky Mountain National Park is the most visited national park in the country. And we average mm -hmm. anywhere from 12 to, four, 12 to 14 million visitors a year in the oh, national wow. park. Just this park. You know, and then the Rocky Mountain National Park is, isn't too far behind and, you know, Yosemite and all these other places. I just think more and more people are, are coming out into the woods again, getting out to the mountains again. And maybe not like hunting and all that kind of stuff, but at least getting out to experience. Yeah. You know, and so I think, right. And I think yeah. that's a big part of the upswing of encounters. People are just mm -hmm. getting back out to where they're going to experience things, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I agree. And that, and also the fact that I think it's becoming, not even becoming, it's become acceptable to have an encounter. It's become acceptable to say, hey, I've experienced this in the social media world. Yeah, you may not be able to tell, you know, your family or your, your spouse, and they might think you're crazy, but you can on social media and have a whole world of people out there willing to accept your story. Right. You know, and I think that's right. making a big difference on it, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I just remember when, growing up as a kid, you know, it was always a family thing to go to the, go to the mountains here in West Virginia and, and go camping, you know, for a week. Most of the time it was in tents or old school buses that had been you know, how they take the old school buses and make them into a, a, a you know, a place to sleep and stuff. Um, well, you know, as you get older, you know, you don't do that as much. And, and I think camping kind of dropped off probably like in what, the late 80s, you know what I mean? And then now it's starting, like you said, it's starting to make a big comeback. People are getting out like they used to, you know, and going to the mountains and stuff like that or to the, to the parks, you know, it's places like that. Um, here in West Virginia, uh, they did. They took the New River Gorge, and it's all federal now. It's, it's a federal uh, park, you know, they, federal park. And then uh, Summersville Lake, they actually turned it into a state park. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more. They're putting more parks out, even up here. I, I don't know about down your way, but you know. Yeah, I mean, they're doing all kinds of stuff around this way. I know. Well, one of my favorite spots, they had blocked off for a few months. And then mm -hmm. they finally opened it back up, and we went back that way. And they had put in a cement culvert, right? It was a road mm -hmm. washout. And I'm kind of going, man, 
that area was shut down for quite a bit of time for just putting in a cement culvert back here. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? But, yeah, it's a spot that goes way back into the smoke, into the national park. It's called the Greenbrier section uh, of the Smoky Mountains. And it takes a ways back there, and then you go along the river back a ways, and it ends in like a big rapids area. But it, it's, a, it's a, a little known yet popular with the locals, if you know the area, spot to go and hang out and get into the woods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, and it's, yeah, that's gorgeous. Oh, yeah, I've, I've never been down there. I always want to go to the Smoky Mountains. My, my grandparents and my mom and dad, or my mom, they went when they was kids a lot of times. They go there like once a year. <laughs> you know, I, I remember seeing the parents, you know, the parents like right next to the car and Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it looked awesome. <laughs> oh, man, it, it's beautiful up here. I've been all over this country. Well, I can't say all over. I haven't been too far out west. Farthest west I've been is Colorado and the Rocky Mountains out that way. Um, but, uh, you know, this area is Tennessee, uh, East Tennessee here in Appalachia is the most beautiful country. Second most beautiful area of the country I've ever been. And first to me is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. but they ain't got the mountains over here as far as the mountains and everything go. It's just absolutely gorgeous country. And it's Bigfoot country, dogman country, um, spooks. I mean, we got the, we got lights out here. You got just all kinds of stuff. So it's a, for somebody yeah. like me that loves the weird and paranormal, it is the place to be. I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. What about you yeah. up there, Drew, living in the big city? <laughs> yeah, I live outside the big city. I I, I still live in the country, so I I, I cannot complain. Uh, Brian, uh, I was just going to ask about Michigan, especially up. Uh, so yeah, oh, the U it's the UP, Chris, not the up, the UP. Yeah, the UP. And there we go. There we go. Well, what what were you going to ask about? It? Brian's always got amazing questions. So what what were you going to ask about the UP? Yeah, go ahead, Brian. I got a quick question about it. Is it kind of like yeah. that, uh, is it kind of like that in Alaska how they have their peninsulas out there? You know that you see on TV. You know the deep coves that go go in. You know what I mean and come back out. Um, right along Lake Michigan, it's got some. Uh, uh, but the the thing with the UP is it's pretty much all wooded. Really. Right. You have yeah. your towns, yeah. but surrounding your towns. Is all woods. All right. If I had any experiences up there, well, I've had a few interesting things happen up that way. That's for sure. Um, so from years uh, nine to seventeen, I lived in the UP of Michigan. That's where my dad's family comes from. Is up there in the UP. And you see, as I start talking about it, you know, I'll start slipping into that accent from up there, don't you know? Um, <laughs> But we had a, a camp up there that my dad and family and I turned into a Bible camp. We had 80 acres of land up there in the middle of the UP and what was Mead Paper Mill country. Uh, if you are familiar with any type of manufacturing, you're familiar with Mead Paper. A lot of your mm -hmm. school paper, your line paper, uh, toilet papers, all that kind of stuff is made from the Mead Paper Mill that comes from the UP. And so logging was a huge industry up there, up in the UP. Um, so we had 80 acres of pre-logged property. So it wasn't virgin forest, but it had already regrown. And uh, we went in there and found some old logging roads and cleared those out and found an old clearing. And we turned that into a Bible camp. So we would spend, um, I was about, I think, 12 years old when we started that. So my, I was 17 when we moved. Uh, so for five years, I spent all my summers up there in the middle of upper Michigan. And sometimes it was just me and my buddy. My dad wouldn't even be up there. He had to go do business. So he'd give us our jobs for the week and we'd have to, you know, do these jobs. And sometimes it was just me and him being 15, 16 years old. Um, a couple of things that really stand out. One that really stood, stands out to me is we were all sitting around a campfire one night. Okay. And we had already put up our chapel. And behind our chapel 
was a big field that we used as like a volleyball field or a soccer field kind of a thing, right? Um, so we were sitting around the campfire one night and we heard a call. The only way I can say is a call. And it sounded like it was coming from behind the chapel in this field. And we're talking probably 100 yards away, give or take. I'm not really good with distance. And it called twice. And my dad said it was some kind of deer call is what he, what he described it as. But to me, that didn't sound right. Like, it just didn't sit with me that it was a deer. We're talking, it's probably about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night, pitch black. We got the campfire going, and we're hooting and hollering and having a good time. And this was a loud, very loud call. Now, mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't Simeon. Like, I, I grew up in the jungles. I know what monkey sound like. It didn't sound like a monkey at all. But I couldn't tell what it was. It was just kind of a weird kind of howl. I could maybe see a cat making it kind of a thing. But only mm -hmm. called twice, mm -hmm. and that was it. Never called again, never heard it again, never heard it once again in the, the you know, 12 years I was up there. You know, so that, that was one that really stands out to me. And I can't even, like, tell you what the call sounded like right, anymore, right? Because it was so long ago. <laughs> that, that was the biggest thing. Now, I've mm -hmm. talked a couple times on some of the other shows about uh, when I heard my dad calling my name when we were out hunting, but he really wasn't. Oh, wow. um, I used to, I used to hear a single cow mooing, right, like way off in the distance. But it wasn't a herd of cows; it was one cow, and it mooed like every fifteen twenty seconds for hours at a time when I was out there by myself in the woods. So that was another strange one. I don't. Um, that was strange. Cows used. To very yeah, right. Cows don't just moo like that, <laughs> you know. No, no. You know, we had we had things raid the camp a couple times. We always chalked it up to bears and coons, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I do know in that exact same area on the BFRO website, they do have an encounter of a Bigfoot crossing the road um, just outside the town of Watson, which is uh, my dad used to church, the church in Watson. Now, when I say towns in the UP, usually there's like <laughs> three buildings, and that's the town. Right, it's a little, so there's not a whole, you know, these are those kinds of towns. Like, in fact, we had one town, Arnold. The town itself was a building, and it held, um, it was the gas station, the local grocery store, the post office, the movie rental store, and then attached to it was the restaurant and bar. Like, that was the town of Arnold, <laughs> you know? Um, and most most towns were known by what, what bar was in their town, you know? Right, right, right. right, um, right. And in that same area, twice, uh, my family saw mountain lions, which were not supposed to exist in the Upper Peninsula. My mom saw one one time as she was driving out to our camp, saw a run across the road in front of her very clearly identified what it was with the, the low slung back and the long, you know, tail that that's even all the way along, like, you know, long bushy tail like that. And then one time when me and my dad were up there, we were looking for a trout stream and we had just gotten back into the car and we're, we're sharing a cold soda and right alongside the car, the passenger side where I was sitting, it, it walked right along there. And then about 10 yards in front of us crossed in front of the car and went off into the woods. Oh, wow. You know? and, and so we saw mountain lion up there. Um, we found moose tracks on the property a couple times. So that was pretty cool. So there was a lot of stuff going on up there. Uh, paranormal, not paranormal. You know, but just like everywhere else, like we were talking earlier, the people up there don't talk to outsiders. If you're not from there, you're not one of them, they're not going to tell you anything. You know? They're, they're some of the most down-to-earth, practical, no-nonsense people that you will ever talk to. And that's including people in Kentucky and Appalachia and West Virginia and Tennessee. <laughs> I got a buddy up there that still calls me from time to time. He's got a farmland up there. And he was telling me a couple of weeks ago about he had this problem. Like he had some goats. And he kept finding goats up in the trees. And he oh, wow. was blaming it on mountain. He's blaming it on mountain lion, and I'm going, well, you know, mountain lion don't do that. But hey, what do I know? 
And he's going, nah, there's no Bigfoot up here. And he's blaming mountain lions. But, you know, because, again, they're so down to and practical. It has to be something normal. Mm-hmm. How close is that to Little Manistique? Oh, man. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, back then, I could care less about geography and stuff, so I couldn't tell you how far. <laughs> I'll tell you, the closest body of water we had is what we call Gene's Pond. And uh, the closest, we were right on the Ford River, if you can look that up. Um, yes, there you go. You got it, buddy. If you live below the bridge, you're a troll. You know what's up. Um, we had a half-mile riverfront on the Ford River. And the closest big town to us was Escanaba, but we were about an hour and a half past Eski. And if you're looking on a map and if you can find the little town of Arnold and Northland and Ralph, we're in that general area. Felch and Felch Mountain were pretty close to us. So we were almost kind of dead center up that way. How close that was to the Manistique Lake, I'm not really sure. But yeah, people people from the UP were called Upers, and if you live below the bridge, you're a troll because trolls live below the bridge, referring to the Mackinac. So anybody from Lower Michigan, we call trolls. <laughs> but yeah, the UP man, it's beautiful God's country, a lot of fascinating history up there. If you're into like alternate history or true history, as I like to call it. Um, yeah. They have amazing copper mines up there, uh, Copper Harbor and all that kind of stuff, right? And they say the copper that actually basically, like, funded the Bronze Age, because bronze is a mix of copper and other metals, right, came from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. They have found copper that is chemically the same from Michigan. They have found it in ancient Egypt, like, in tombs of the pharaohs and stuff like that. They have found it in old Phoenician um, finds and stuff. They have traced this copper from Upper Michigan all around the world. Um, if you look into alternate history and the fact that the world was completely populated before the so-called founding modern age, or however you want to put it. Um, so the history of the UP is absolutely fascinating. That is fascinating to find copper from mm -hmm. from there in the tombs of the pharaohs. That, that's that's yep. awesome. That yep, awesome. absolutely amazing. <laughs> now no one know what you're talking about. about. Yeah. Yeah, no man's land, dude. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you know the the Bible camp is still going. So that's kind of fun. That's kind of cool. Um, you know, we started it when I was twelve years old. Um, it's not the same as it was, <laughs> but it's still operating and functioning. I plan on going back one day and, and checking it out to see how it is now. Yeah, that that's awesome. That it's still yep, yep. Uh, Russ says, "Hear people talking to loved ones when they're climb, uh, climb, uh, climbing Mount, uh, climbing Mount Everest, and they saw the Yeti." Mm -hmm. So, yeah, interesting. Yep. Yeah, that, that's an interesting phenomenon. Is hearing people that you know out in the woods hollering at you. You know, fun thing with the Yeti, yeah. I don't know if you guys have done much studying on, on the Yeti and all that. <laughs> Lauren Coleman, in his books, really breaks down a lot of what the Yeti lore really is, as opposed to what we know from the movies and the mm -hmm. TVs and stuff like that. And what he puts forth is that Yetis don't live in the mountains at all. The Yeti is a general term like we have for Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And he's actually identified, I believe, there's like seven different types. Oh, wow. And Yeti yeah. is a catch-all for all of them. And he said the way he puts it is they actually live in the valleys of all the mountains because they're, they're, they're more subtropical. There's vegetation and rivers and lots of food. And the reason people cite them or see them on the mountains is they're crossing from one valley section to another valley section. And I thought that was an absolutely fascinating way to look at it, that they're just happened to be crossing. Cause we, everybody goes, how could they live up there? There's no food source, very little shelter. The climate's absolutely horrendous. 
And he's going, they don't live up there. They're actually just crossing the mountains to get to the valleys where the, the food sources are, where the shelter is, where the water is. I think that's a fascinating theory. That is because I never would really thought of that until you just said that. I mean, now that you said it, it makes sense. I mean, it does yeah. make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I remember the first time. <laughs> Well, I, first, I remember the first place I remember about Yeti, but they called it the Abominable Snowman, Scooby Doo. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was that was that was the my intro in the end of the Yeti, you know. Yeah, and and snowman. the biggest thing, they're not even white. They're not white. Mm-hmm. They're they're they're, they're Bigfoot colors. They're the dark browns, the blacks, the the you know. I don't think I've even heard of any Auburn ones. Mostly like very dark brown to black. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to to movies and media, right? Telling us what they want us to know, but yeah, they don't. They're they're not reported as being white at all. That that's a complete media fabrication from when they first started translating the story over from Nepalese over to English and American stuff. Right, that that's where the, the name Abominable Snowman came from was a mistranslation of the wording. And mm-hmm. then with the name mm-hmm. Snowman, they just said, Oh, it's a snowman, it must be white. And that's where the idea of the white colors came from. It really oh, had oh, nothing man. to do with the stories and the sightings. It was all about the name. Well, wow. maybe it was just covered with snow, you know. That, you yeah, I mean it makes sense. Makes oh, sense. Okay. Yeah. I, I now I can buy that theory. You cover with snow yeah. or have snow on sure. it. So yeah. Stephen Russ has yeah. got me into it also. So yeah. yeah. See, I, well, I just wasn't all of that. A ring pen deck. Yeah, there you go. Now that's the that's one from pen. South America, right? No, oh, that's Indonesia. In, Indonesia. Okay, Indonesia. Yeah. Think, think orangutan. Ring Panda, uh-huh. Panda. I, think. I knew a guy. Oh, what's his name? Dolly. I can't pronounce his last name, so I'm not going to. Um, Dolly, uh-huh. D A L O Y. Um, he's a researcher out there, and he uh, researches the Ring Panda. Um, he's got some fascinating stuff on it. Now, are they the smaller ones? Or do yes. they get the same size? No, they're they're um, child size, like like three foot that most people would call them a monkey except for the fact that they're tailless obviously so it's not a monkey it's, it's an ape and then secondly they're sighted upright they're they're more arboreal they hang out in trees a lot um uh-huh. but they when they walk on the ground they do walk on two legs they're completely bipedal wow and they wow. don't fit the description yeah. of any other primate in the area right they're, they're, right. Again, they're not a monkey. They don't have a tail. Um, they're, they're seen by scientists. They're, they're seen by lots of people out there. Um, and a, a lot of times they, they, they see them clinging to trees, right? Like camouflage. They're, they're bear hugging a tree so you can't see them. But if right, you happen right, to be right. an observer and you notice them, then, then you're seeing these guys and they'll get down and run away from you. Wow. So they're not aggressive, you know, like, you know, they say some of our big are aggressive over here in the United States. Uh, I can't say one way or the other, but I can say Um, I've never heard a report of them being aggressive. They're definitely, the reports I get are them trying to flee and hide and get away from people. That's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, they just like here, they find foot uh, footprints, they're, they're trackways of them. They find hair. They find all kinds of stuff around Pendek. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you, Brian. I think an orang Pendek will be proved before Bigfoot will. Um, it's a smaller area to look. There's more people in there looking. Um, the culture there accepts the orang Pendek as a real creature. Um, and then scientists that aren't primatologists, the scientists studying the ecosystem and things like that, they're, they're having encounters with them. So if any one of our, our cryptids, our, our, our upright walking apes are going to be found, I think a Rempendic is, is really going to be the first one to come across. And Nicole is yeah. bringing up Bumble. Red Off, the red-nosed <laughs> <Yeah>. reindeer. <laughs> so, I remember yeah. that, yeah. 
<laughs> that is correct, <laughs> Mikhail. I, so, well, the thing about Bumble is that everybody knows is they sink. <laughs> they sink. And so they Roger bounce. wants to know, uh, he says right here, what's supposed to be the difference between a Bigfoot, a skunk ape, or is there a difference? What'd you get um, on the bottom? What are y'all doing? What, what are y'all doing? He's bouncing all over the place. <laughs> Chris, you want to take that one? Uh, we, 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 uh, oh. Ladies and gentlemen, we're playing. Well, there we're playing Hollywood here. Squares. Look at that. Right? Right? Now, now what are you doing down there again? <laughs> what are y'all doing uh, to what? me? Are y'all messing? <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> Now, from from what I've read, you know, and stuff, uh, the skunk apes are a little bit smaller, and I heard they're more aggressive. I mean, from the reports I've read and stuff, they're very more aggressive than, you know, our bigger Bigfoot that lives up more for, you know. Well, I mean, if, if I was covered in that much hair, and I mean, I'm pretty close. Cover that much hair living down there in the swamps, that'd be pretty ornery, too. Oh, no doubt. What it had to be miserable for him. I mean, honest to God, living in yeah. the swamps and the mosquito I mean, mosquitoes and flies and bugs and snakes and just everything. Sure, interesting stuff with the skunk ape, though. Everybody thinks that they're called the skunk ape because of the smell, right? That's what everybody says, but. Um, going back to some of the researchers from the area, and for the life of me, I can't remember his name. And I'm sorry, because you're a buddy of mine, and I got you on Facebook, and I've talked to you in person at the conferences, but I can't remember your name for nothing. Um, <laughs> hold on, Stacy, Stacy Brown, Stacy Brown Jr. He's a, he's a skunk ape researcher down there in North Florida. The Originally, where the term skunk ape comes from, was a particular creature that was sighted down there that had a white stripe along its head. That is correct. Like a skunk. So therefore, that's where the term skunk ape came from, has absolutely nothing to do with the smell. Now, just, just, head, just think of a gremlin. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> But that now, being I don't know said, if it multiplies when it gets wet now, I'm I hope not. not. Saying that. <laughs> so, right. That being said, with them living in the swampier areas and stuff like that, they are going to be probably smellier because if you ever been in the swamp and stirred up the the muck and detritus on the bottom of a swamp, you get that sulfur smell that comes from the rotting vegetation. You know, so if they are living and traversing in swamps and getting that muck on them, then they are going to be a little more, I mean, they're going to smell foul and have that sulfuric smell to them. So while, yes, they didn't get named skunks because of the smell, they sure do stink to high heavens for the most part. I'm wondering yeah. if that's why they come out with swatch soap. <laughs> 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 Maybe, but I tell you what, I'm a firm believer in, in Squatch soap. I love that stuff. Dr. Squatch, man. Um, a, a thing I was uh, thinking about here was we were talking about the skunk apes. Um, they would probably have one of the best food supplies there is. Because, I mean, there's snakes, there's, there's pigs, there's yep. deer. I mean, they have a very good variety of of a food supply year round. I mean, you know, yeah. it doesn't get cold, gators. you know. Yeah, 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 gators. Yeah, I mean, anything. And, and now like, oh, I've yeah. seen uh, Brian put a thing down there about Burmese pythons and stuff. I mean, now they got them. They can yeah. eat them big snakes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of competition there, Brian. You get yourself a, you know, a big old skunk ape, he's going to twist himself up a snake and then chew on that for a bit, you know what I mean? There's not yeah, a whole lot of competition just, there. Just snap and yeah. snap. Yeah. <laughs> oh. and, uh, really make... interesting theory that I came across in studying the skunk ape is some people believe that they will hang out 
in underwater caves. Really? And in alligator caves. I don't know if y'all know this, but alligators will actually hollow out an entrance underwater to like a cave and then go up and have a dry land kind of like a beaver lodge kind of a thing, but not a lodge. It's just it's in the bank of the river and they, they're, they're gator dens <clears throat> and they go up in there and a lot of, not a lot, but some people believe that Sasquatch will use these dens as a place to hide or as, as, as a cave, as a place to live. And that, that attributes to some of their smell because gators have a strong smell when it comes to their waste and that kind of a stuff. And, mm-hmm. and that's one of the, the theories that I have come across in studying these guys. And I think it's very, a very plausible theory. Um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that gators actually did that. I didn't know they would, yeah. you know, burrow and then go up to a drop spot underneath the ground. That's an now awesome that theory. A, I mean, a whole new yeah. meaning to noodling, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. You know, <laughs> listen, there's a reason you don't noodle in Florida. <laughs> you might get yanked in there. I ain't noodling nowhere to begin with, especially not in no. Florida. <laughs> no, when people um, do that, uh, God bless them because there ain't no way I'm sticking my hand in no hole in the water. <laughs> yeah, I know, nope. right? I know what a nope. snapping turtle can do. <laughs> I'll tell you yeah. why I don't. Growing up in Columbia, we would go snorkeling in the rivers and stuff sometimes. We had what we called the paseo, which is an outing, right? And we'd go, mm-hmm. to, I remember one specific place we'd go to where there was a, a warm water river and a cold water river, and they met, okay, at this juncture. And so we would go there, and Mama would set up a tripod and build a fire and cook us a big old pot of chicken stew. And then we'd all go snorkeling. And then dad and the older brothers would go spear fishing. And one time we were going down the river and we were following behind my dad and my brother spear fishing. And all of a sudden we hear my dad yelling, get out of the water, get out of the water. So of course, as we were trained, when dad speaks, you listen. And so we hightailed it out of the water. My brother, who might have been 14 at the time, had speared an electric eel. Oh, my. With his with his uh, spear gun, he thought it was a catfish, right? Because he said as he was going along the riverbank, he just saw the little head poking out about this big, and it had the whiskers on it like a catfish. So he thought it was some kind of catfish. So he speared this thing in the head and pulled it out of the hole, and it just kept coming and just kept kept coming. It was a four and a half foot oh, electric eel, my brother speared. Oh no! Thankfully, where he shot it in the head. <laughs> is short circuited so it couldn't do any electrocution. Yeah. Because yeah. a four footer probably couldn't kill a grown man, but it sure would stun you pretty good and you sure would feel it. Oh, I guess. You know what I mean? I, but I, I, I know that story and that sticks with me. I ain't putting my hands in no holes in the riverbanks. Uh, no, sir. I, I didn't know how you got <laughs> swimming down there because after watching, uh, what was that guy that had the show, Monster Flea? Went to Amazon and all that. Wade. Wade, yeah. yeah. Some of the fish can eat you down there. I mean, they have teeth, you know, like like that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Chris, and this is the truth of it. Uh, my family and our mission group was down there for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And for a part of that time, I lived on a lake. Now, when I mean on a lake, I mean in the middle of a lake on a house on stilts in the middle of a lake. Mm-hmm. All right. In the 12 years that people lived on that lake, only one person had ever been bit by a piranha on that lake. Oh, wow. And that was a lady who was sitting on the deck and like a dock in the middle of the lake. And she had her feet kicking in the water and she was washing dirty diapers. All right. Because we didn't ah. use disposable diapers. We used cloth diapers. Right. And so yeah, that yeah. combination of the dirty diapers and her white feet flashing, one came up, bit her on the toe, and then swam away. Oh, wow. That was literally the only negative encounter we had the entire time we were down there with piranha. Okay, now that being said, we also had anaconda. Oh, man. Anacondas were considered a shoot-on-site animal. 
because there were kids out there like myself. I was the crawling toddler out there on that lake, and they would uh -huh. get us. And so anacondas were shoot on sight, and the lake was full of black caiman, which is, you know, a type of alligator. And those were a food source for us. But we were uh -huh. never, never scared. Like, we went swimming in that water. We went boating in that water. We went fishing in that water. And we were never scared of the water. It was never an issue for us, ever. Wow, that, that's that's cool, though. I mean... That ain't cool. I'd be scared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, TV is laws to think that if you go down there and you go in the water, piranhas are going to eat you. You know what I mean? No matter what, wherever yeah. you go, they're going to eat you. That is something that can happen, okay? So I'm not going to say it can't happen, but it's a very specific type of fish under uh, very specific uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then it's in the dry season when the water is dry up. But y'all don't understand what dry season is. Like, the lake will drop 15 to 20 feet oh, in dry wow. season. Yeah, so dry season is just that. It is dry. So you get these pools there the fish concentrate. And eventually, they eat up all the food, and so they're starving. Ooh, so if something, okay. fall, if something okay. falls in that water and it attracts the fish, then that's when you get the swarms and stuff happening. So yeah. I'm not going to say yeah. it can't happen, it never happened, it doesn't happen, because it does. But where yeah. we were at, yeah. that wasn't he a concern. He just said it doesn't happen, but then he says it does happen, Chris. So no, I'm I said we're <laughs> Where we were at, it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I understand. Well, that, we at, I was just saying, and that's, that's another way TV is programmed. Is that if you yeah. go down to the Amazon and you go in any type of water, you're going to get ate up by a piranha or some other kind of fish. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. That's another way that they, they you know, uh, yeah. made us oh. think different things than what really is true, you know? Listen, here's the truth with piranha. We used to catch them as a little bugger in the jungle, right? Me and my little Indian friends would get a pole with some fishing line on it and dig up some grubs somewhere and throw it in the water, and we'd catch piranha like bluegill. Mm -hmm. We'd take mm -hmm. them back up to mom and dad, and they'd cook them up, and we'd eat them. Yeah, I heard they're, 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 them, I mean. Yeah, they're bluegill with nasty teeth is what they are. <laughs> I'll never look at another sunfish again like that. <laughs> we were Same more bluegill. scared of. We were more wary and more scared of spiders and snakes and ants oh, yeah. than anything oh, yeah. else. Insects. Insect life is what we were more scared of. Nate, yeah. I was in, yep, the Amazon jungle of Colombia. The main town I lived in and where I was born was called Via Vicencio. And then when I lived in the jungle, we were in the Orinoco River Basin of the Amazon jungle. On a map, I could not pinpoint it to you because it's the jungle. But that was the area that was called the Orinoco River Basin in the Amazon jungle in Colombia. Were they tasty? They, they, they were bluegill. They tasted like bluegill. Yeah. They are a little pain fish. Like, I've never ate a bluegill, but I heard it's one of the best eating fish there is. Brian, That's we actually had both down there. Um, normally we caught the red bellies. Um, and the bigger, and that was in the jungle, was normally the red bellies because we had the little uh, uh, canos, the uh, streams, sorry. Um, but in the bigger lakes and bigger bodies of water, we would catch black piranha and red belly piranha. The black piranha is the biggest piranha species there is, and they get to be like the size of some bass. They get to be pretty huge. They're not as aggressive, but they're massive. Tell Ooh. them that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, well, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, you know, they're they're supposed to know not to bite you. They're I mean, yeah. they are they are programmed to know this stuff. <laughs> My luck, I get the one. They're like finding Nemo, right? Oh, right. Hello, yeah. hello. You know, well, and, you know again, here's Grizzly. Like, when we lived in the town and at the school base, we had a lake that we would go fishing at, and it was called Lopez Lake, and it was out in the middle of the plains, the the Llanos. 
So a big part of Columbia is just plains. People don't realize the diversity of the ecosystems out there. Um, huge plains, huge plains in Columbia. And we got permission to fish at this lake in the middle of these cattle fields. The lake itself was full of piranha, of anaconda, of black caiman, uh, peacock bass, which is why we were there for the peacock bass. And we would go out there and spend an entire day fishing on this lake. And it got to the point where we would get float tubes. I don't know if you guys know what float tubes are, but essentially it's a big old inner tube that you float around in, but it's got webbing and a seat in it and it's got pockets for fishing and then holders and all this kind of stuff. And my dad would put me in a float tube and he'd go snorkeling with his spear gun all around this lake that was full of anacondas and alligators and piranhas. Yeah. Y yeah. That was normal crazy. for us. That was normal crazy. for us. That was just part of it, you know? And I remember one time being out with dad and he'd, he'd have me like 20 yards on a rope and he'd be pulling me so I could feel like I was alone and having fun. Right. Mm -hmm. And he said one time he swam over about an eight foot caiman laying there on the bottom of the river. Now, most of the lake itself was probably four or five foot deep in, in most parts of it. Okay. And so he, he remembers swimming over one and he said he was tempted to go down there and spear this thing in the head. Oh, but he, better. De better. he decided not to, because he was pulling me. And if he missed, he didn't want me to get tangled up in the mess. That tells you what yeah. kind of hardcore yeah. dude my dad was. Right, because he's like, I'm gonna go down and spear this gator that's two foot longer than I am. He didn't care. <laughs> but we went out to this lake over the years. I mean, so many times, not a single person ever got bit, ever got attacked, ever had an issue with any of these critters. Not once. Yeah, my that's dad was super great. My, we could do a whole show on my dad and, and how crazy he was and the type of man he is. That's awesome, you know. You, yeah, it's it awesome that you got like, the and all that. Yeah, yeah, you know what it sounds like, Chris. It sounds like, uh, hey, hey, Justin, hold my beer, watch this. <laughs> I know, I know, right? <laughs> Even I hear some of the stories, and I just got to go, man, that that's just nuts. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we had we had bigfoot stories down there. The Indians had bigfoot stories. The Andes have bigfoot stories. You know, mm -hmm. so even down there, you know, I was yeah. looking at something yeah. on the Facebook internet today about living dinosaurs, and I believe living dinosaurs could be possible in places like the Amazon or in the African jungles or some of these other places. You know, to me, it seems feasible. You just well, don't know what you're going to find in, in the jungles and the remote areas of the world. We had somebody on the show the other day. I forgot what show it was. Uh, that uh, uh, somebody shot. Uh, what was it? A pterodactyl or somebody saw a pterodactyl? I can't remember what it was, but they saw one. We did a show on that, Grizz. One of my first shows yeah. that we did with you was the dinosaurs. But somebody and... in the chat room said they 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 saw a bird or something in the tree. They shot it. And and they went back the next morning, and they and they found the tracks of it, but the, it was gone. I, I, I think it was oh, in the chat room. Yeah, was that one? Was it Nicole? Was you in that one, or Brian, or somebody? When they were talking about the pterodactyl, I can't remember which show that was on. That wasn't my show. That's great. No, yeah, it, it was recent. <laughs> so that's that part of it, Brian. <laughs> there's, one, there's one place that really fascinates me, and I've read a little bit of it, but I want to get really into it. It was the Nahani, Nahani Valley. That is one place that I really, it, it kind of fascinates me because they say, you know, there's there's a valley there that's tropical like and supposed to have dinosaurs and woolly mammoth still there. That's something I, 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 I really want to dig into that place because it's, it's a fascinating, yeah. fascinating story. I mean, just, you know, about the guys that were found with no heads and stuff out right there. And, and, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. really amazing. Finding yeah. people with no heads? Uh, yeah, yes. the Headless Valley. 
Headless, yeah, Headless Valley, Valley up in uh, Canada. Yeah. And you want to go there? Well, I would like to see it one of these days. No, no. I mean, you're, you're, no, I'm good. <laughs> now, let's take it for granted. When did that happen? Like the 1800s? Oh, that's okay. Yeah. During okay. the during, during the very, you know, well, right. It, okay. it has a, hit, a long history of it, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it spans it spans across, you know, hundreds of years, all this going on. And, yeah. the, like, the natives yeah. tell legends of creatures up there that take your heads, and, and then they started finding, like, miners and prospectors, uh, cabins burned down, and their heads made, like, all kinds of stuff. But then again, there's people that the visit all the time still the without any issues. But there are reports yeah. of, like you said, yeah. dinosaur creatures in this valley and, and reports of mastodon in the valley. It's absolutely a crazy story if you look at it. What's that for it as a, what's your word there, Chris? The uh, uh, totality of circumstances, right? Yeah. Totality, the totality of right, evidence yeah, yeah. in this valley is absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah. It's, I, I've seen pictures and going down the river. The, the rock walls are very, very high and they're straight up and down. Like the, the river runs right through a very sharp valley. I mean, there's not much room, you know what I mean, in between, you know, each cliff, each side. And uh, I, I just find it a very fascinating story. I mean, the, the, and, then, and then one Indian tribe run out another Indian tribe uh, yep. up there. And it's. It's a fascinating story. I mean, it, it blows my mind like, just a little bit. I've read it. Just... There's layers upon layers of stories involved with the Headless Valley. Absolutely, and I think I think there's pockets like that all around the world. You know, pockets oh, yeah. of weird and strange yeah, phenomena, right? Like places where they could have um, um, isolated creatures. I mean, that's that's a, a natural evolutionary phenomenon. Is is pockets mm -hmm. of of species being isolated from others and then kind of evolving on their own. I, I'm not a proponent of evolution. I don't believe in macroevolution, but I do believe in microevolution where you're going to have species that break off into subspecies and kind of further separate because of isolation, you know, and that happens. Yeah. I think that that's legit. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're, I, missed what that last if, one said. Uh, if, I mean, if you're, if you're a, with a certain group, you know, constantly every day, and no one else comes in new. I mean, yeah. you're going to, you're going to. How do I put it? I'm not real smart when it comes to science. Uh, you're, you're going to change over a period of time. Your 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 sure. bodies, your your DNA is going to change. I yeah. mean, you know. Uh, did you see the, the latest thing they're talking about? They're going to start. Trying to clone the Nathaniel. The, the, I can't say I knew that it. Oh, uh, the, the caveman. <laughs> uh, I, I knew say it caveman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. They talked about it for years. I knew they were going to. I, right. I, I'm surprised if they haven't already done it. I, I would Wait say they haven't done it. I was going to say, who says they haven't done it yet and they're trying to perfect it? Yeah, I think they've done did it. It's hey, just, I've, seen us, no, have eyes. I've seen the Eagles have eyes. I've seen long term. Yes. Heard that. <laughs> yeah, because no. supposedly they're going to try to clone the Neanderthal. Uh, well, apparently I mean, they've been working on the, the woolly mammoth for years. Like, it might, they're going to cross the woolly mammoth DNA with a uh, Indonesian elephant. I was hearing that yeah. back when I was in middle school. You know what I mean? Yeah, so they were yeah, talking about yeah, that way yeah. back then. I wonder if they but, did it already. We just don't know. <laughs> probably. I mean, they've already done Dolly the Sheep. How, how long ago did they clone Dolly the Sheep? And they're cloning Black Angus cows and all this yeah, kind of stuff yeah. since I was a youngin', you know? Right, right. right. So yeah. I don't see the thing with Neanderthal, which I find, again, I'm a real big proponent of alternate history. I don't think anything was how we're told it was. Um, um, they say, I mean, Neanderthal DNA is in a lot of the current population. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to me, yeah. here's why I look at it. I don't understand this thing with, with humans. Everything is a race, right? So we, we're all races. There's, there's African American, there, there's Colombian, there's, there's the races, right? Yeah. And yeah. yet in yeah. animals, 
And animals, we call them species. Yeah. The, yeah. Right? If, if, if you can have the same animal, okay, eastern mountain lion versus the standard mountain lion. They're two separate species. Right? They're, they're the mm -hmm. same critter. They're just living yeah. different parts of the world, different parts of the country. <laughs> right? Right. And why don't we apply that to humans? Well, because then we're, we're being racist or we're being, you know, supremacist or we're doing all this other stuff. But to me, that doesn't make sense. Like, if it's science, it's science, it's science, right? If you look at, and my, my biggest thing is Australian Aborigines, okay? 100% yeah. yeah. human, their structure, their skeletal structure is different than, like, your typical white guys like us up here in the middle of the USA. Why? Right. Because they live right. differently. Their, their, their genetics are different. They are different than we are. Now, it's not a racial issue at all. It's no, based it's on no, where we live and how we have to experience our lives. It's a known thing, right? And, right. and so I personally believe creatures like, like Neanderthal, or, you know, the Denovian man or all these other so-called other humans or subhumans or offshoot species, of whatever you want to call them. I think they're just all people just like us, but they were a different tribe, different type. They, they were different genetics. They lived differently. So they developed in a little bit different ways than all of us. I don't think Neanderthal was necessarily a caveman. Or he grunted and scratched himself and spit on the, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think they were right. just right. other people, just like we were people, just like we are people. Yeah, they was, you know, to me, that, that just makes more sense. So, of course, that we would have some of their DNA structure in ours because look what happens nowadays with tribes. You have conquering tribes, and then the other tribes, like, like breed into the population and get absorbed into the population. That, that's just mm -hmm. how it works with people shifting around. So why we have to label this whole, this was Neanderthal, this was this, this was that, I think is part of, I'm not going to use the word conspiracy, but just part of the idea of evolution and macroevolution and human evolution as a way for them to kind of support it, even though I think it's not really supporting it. Right. right. That's right. my soapbox. I mean, even, even look, take a look at our Native American tribes. All yeah. different. There, there, none of them are exactly the same. You know what I mean? Some of them are tall and, and lanky. Some of them are short. And, yeah. and, and you know, it's just, it's just where we live. Where, where you? What part of the, the state you grew up in? You know, you know, some uh -huh. used to the warm weather. Some people grew up in the cold. You know, of Alaska yeah. and you know Canada, and it's just where. It's, I think it's all where you grew up at, you know, your surroundings, you know what I mean? Yep. That has a lot to do with that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like, one of the things with, with the Aborigines in Australia that they discovered was that they had really large... I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Jawbones. Yeah. Okay, okay no problem. They had really large, strong jawbones. And the reason being is because they used their jaws and their teeth as an extra pair of hands when they were doing something or, or manipulating, making stuff, or they would they could cut down trees. Our Indians would cut down trees by gnawing on them like beavers. I did not. They didn't. They didn't have tools. They didn't have any type of axe or stone mm -hmm. tools. So they would chew on them to the point where they could bend them over and break them. And wow. as, ask anybody that, that does muscle building or, or anything like that, your bone gets denser the more you use the bone and muscles in that area. And so they have these really strong jaw bones. And they're denser and they're built out more than people like us that don't use our teeth for stuff and our jaw bones and the muscles in our jaw bones for stuff, you know. And that's mm -hmm. not in any way derogatory. It's simply their life and how they live and how they adapt it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Brian, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the victorious yeah. are the ones that write write the history books, or the ones that want to tell the narrative of what they believe happened. They're the ones that write the history books. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, they, they change they change history just by going. My I got, my girls are in. One's gonna be in fifth, and one's gonna be in or fourth or fifth and sixth. 
grade this year. Uh -huh. And they don't teach them what they taught. I mean, I'm 49, and they do not even teach close to what we grew up. Nah. You know, l learning in school or, you know, homeschooling, whatever, you know, you did back then. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shame. The, the kids really don't know the true history. No. I mean, even though they, they didn't teach us everything either, but no, we got more, we got more out of our teachers, you know what I mean, than them books anyway. That's pretty much what yeah. the teacher taught. And I think that's why he stuck it in the history. I always liked it. You know, the history, Civil War, and you know, all that stuff, and, and the Revolutionary yeah. War is another thing. Uh, it's just, I like history. I was <laughs> not a big history buff. I'm, I'm more of a sciences guy. Get me in sciences and math. Yeah. And I, that's what I'm into. I'm not a history guy at all. <laughs> I'm getting not into the thing. science now. I, uh, I'm, I'm taking my uh, ham technician's test Saturday. So okay. I wanted to get into that. I'm an electrician anyway, but I was when I was able to work by trade. And now I want to get into the electronic part, you know, learning about, you know, capacitors and all that stuff, transistors. Man, can well, you, you guys got to study that 20 years ago? Look where, where, where would we be now? No. You got to study Tesla now. Yeah, it's. No. We know it's, it's funny. Just saying, there talking about solar panels and all this kind of stuff and the big we had solar panels in the jungle you know in the 80s we used solar that, panels yeah. to, to run we had a computer the what we had two electronic devices that we had to run in the jungle we had our computer that my dad mm -hmm. used for his translation work mm -hmm. and then we had the shortwave radio so mm -hmm. we could communicate mm -hmm. with the outside world you know, those are the two things that we had, and they were just run on solar panels way back then in the 80s. Everybody's all like, oh, solar panel, new technology. Nope. Sorry. No. <laughs> we, we had that way back when. Right? Yeah, solar panels, old technology. Yeah. Now, yeah, now they're solar. complaining about the, what's the thing that goes, the... Things, the windmill, uh, the wind turbine. Yeah, the windmills. Them. Yeah, they're now yeah. now they're saying that's old technology. They're killing yeah. birds and everything and all that other stuff and well, ruining you know, you landscapes get, and. Well, you mm -hmm. go back to, you know, the whole deal in Texas when it got cold. The mill windmills don't work so good, I guess, in the in the ice, you know. So they, they was without power for a while down. What was it, a couple of years ago they had that bad ice storm? They learned real yeah. quick. <laughs> right, right. I know, Nicole, I couldn't think. I was like, the little, the little, yeah. you know what it remind me of? It remind me of Titanic, where she was like, I was looking at the little thing that went, uh, the little, and the guy was like, uh, <laughs> <"Dell work?" laughs> Yeah, windmill. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> Have you guys ever but, seen, uh, like, the windmill farms and stuff that they've had? You ever seen those? Yeah, on the way to Chicago yeah. when I had to take that yeah. civilian class and when I got out of law enforcement, the Wickland Sulander or Sulander Wicklander class. Yeah. Uh yeah. I, I I couldn't believe. I mean, you can see them for miles and miles. Uh -huh. Crazy. And uh and I could not believe when I saw one one of the blades being transported. How long the oh, they were. Yeah. I remember because in Wisconsin it was a big thing because farmers were making more money renting their land to the windmill people than they were farming crops, and so a Same lot of the farmers were, thing. yep, they were giving up crop farming and renting them out to windmill farmers. They didn't have to do anything at all. The farmers Same had no responsibility. Cell phone towers, yeah, out here yep. in the country, cell phone towers, yep. Yeah, they was going out here in West Virginia though. The cell phone tower thing they was calling to people's houses if you had a high ridge yep. you know and they wanted yep. to put a cell phone tower and, uh we have a few of the windmills here in west virginia like down in uh tucker county has them uh there's some close to here in morgantown but they're on the pa side the pa border side there's a couple yeah that you can see they're not a bunch of them though you know just like one or two here or there I had fields, man. It'd be like twenty or thirty of them, and just 
It was crazy. Very crazy to see. Right. And that was right. supposed to be the big thing, wasn't it? And then now, now where is it at? Just kind of, eh. Right. Talk more to upkeep right. them than it did to produce electricity out of them. Right. <laughs> now, they got, now we got electric cars. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at all the kids mining the cobalt, you know, and oh, and yeah. and now they're saying about 2030. Now, 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 now he sucker me into it. And by yep. 2030, the U.S. government wants all of the vehicle manufacturers to manufacture EV vehicles only, and I don't want no EV vehicle. No, you know, you know, it's crazy about electrical vehicle guys. Do you know? They had electrical vehicles back when Ford was first putting out, like, the model Ford cars. Yes. Yep. Electrical yes, vehicles, even before electrical vehicles and then gas-powered vehicles, they had steam-powered cars. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, they did. All this alternate technology is not new technology. It's been around, but it's been suppressed because yeah. certain people didn't know how to, to make money off of it, basically. No, the petroleum, remember? That, you that's, but see, the petroleum people couldn't figure out how to make money off of the other ones, too. Right. Because if it was, right. think about it. Think about it. Why would there not be a monopoly if, if you controlled the petroleum fields and you could also control, you know, electrical vehicles and you could also control steam-powered vehicles? You would do it, right? Yeah, you run all steam, three. So steam-powered trains. Yep. But that's because of the power capacity is different. Mm -hmm. But the petroleum people ran there, and that's what they went with because that was easily accessible, and then that's what they could control easier. You know, they had that grid already built into the system that they controlled the petroleum, you know, because that was already yeah. stuff before gasoline. They were still already using oil for stuff. There was already oil fields, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cars just kind of yeah. like escalated it uh, that much more. Did you see what Chris suckered us into? <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, he sure did. Uh, I, I, I knew didn't it was mean to. I, I, I didn't mean to. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Car. If you're going to have electric cars, let's go, Brandon. <laughs> you're going to need coal mines. You got to have coal to run electric. They can say, know. you know, windmills and this and that, but it takes that coal miner going underground every day to get that yep. coal out of the ground. Yep. It's a shame, but that's that's the truth of it. <laughs> I agree. What's uh, that, Nicole? Nicole? You said you're out there in California, right? Isn't that where they push, really push the electric vehicles? But then when when... The grid goes down. They tell you not to charge your car because too many people are charging right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the grid went down, and so they lost power. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. the lights are going out in town, and air conditioners are going out, so they're telling people not to plug in their cars. Okay. Now, Chris started this. Now, <laughs> why are people driving around in Teslas and electric mm -hmm. vehicles with gas power generators in the trunk? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it's got to have I mean, some. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm not. I'm being serious. I'm seeing these vehicles on the side of the road, and people texting on their phones, and people are stopping and filming them with the generator, saying, "What?" Um, yeah, I'm being serious with the gas generator. Yep, I know you are. Yeah, you're 100 right, Griff. Nico was laughing. <laughs> yeah, electric bridge over the ocean. <laughs> Have you guys uh, ever heard of wood gas vehicles? What what is it now? It's called wood gas. Wood that like trees. Wood. Wood I, gas. I, I, yeah, I've, I've oh, heard yeah, of that. Now, yeah. now you're talking to flex capacitor, right? Back to the future. Almost, almost. So apparently, and I don't know how it works, but I read about it in in magazines on like being self sustaining and, and like homestead magazines and stuff like this where you can basically, you, you build a fire, a certain type of fire in a barrel in the back of your pickup truck, there's a way you convert it over, and it produces something called wood gas, and the wood gas runs your vehicle. It's not steamed engine, it's nothing like that, okay. but right. it's literally... Decker, go ahead. I, I'm, 
I'm I'm going to excuse you because you live in the mountains. All right. Now, <laughs> have you have you not realized that the New York people are throwing a fit because they're trying to get rid of the wood burning pizza ovens? Because oh, yeah. they're burning wood because Jeez, they're making they're pizzas. Weird. Oh yeah! I mean, is that not a crime and shame? See, see the Chris started. As, as a chef, I find that absolutely horrendous. Just saying. Oh, man. And I got a pellet smoker, and I'm not going to quit burning my pellets. I'm no. Sorry. Right. Absolutely not. It's it's terrible. It's it's a it's a shame. I mean, that they're trying to do everything possible in the yes, world. To, to, Thanks, Chris. Now, now, now you got me on gas stoves at home. When I heard that, yeah. I'm like, you got to be joking. Then we got to do get rid of gas furnaces, too. Right. Yeah. Water heaters. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I, 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 I ain't giving up my I ain't giving up our show into uh, uh, with <laughs> it's it, it. conversation. <laughs> I like oh, my yeah. charcoal. I, I like my kings of charcoal. <laughs> <laughs> so you, well, you never know which yes, direction the rabbit hole is going to go. Between gas and charcoal. Yeah, and, and yes, <laughs> oh, yeah. You can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so. you can. I like either way. I, I, it doesn't bother me, you know, either way. Gas or charcoal or propane. Yeah. Uh, um. Let's. I, I, let me get you another subject here. <laughs> so, what, so actually, uh, Brian, uh, people were going to fast food places, thanks to Chris, got us on the subject, and getting uh, their yeah. own, own grease and converting it into diesel. And the government threw a fit over that. And actually, I so know, I don't know if they're doing that anymore. I, I, I think they stopped it. Did, did they or did yeah. they not? Yeah. You can filter yeah. uh, cooking grease, okay, cooking oil, like fryer oil, and I believe it's a diesel engine, like in the, the 60s diesel engines. You can run it straight with no conversion. And I saw this on an episode of Mythbusters, so I know it's got to be true, right? Mm -hmm. Where you, you're <laughs> using that filtered, <laughs> that filtered fryer oil straight into these old diesel engines, and they're working. And it's comparable uh, mileage. It's comparable energy coming out of this fryer oil. Absolutely. You can't do it with the modern ones. But the it's older, it's something to do with the, the 60 diesel motors. You can run straight fry oil in it. Yeah, Nicole, I think yeah. you're right. I think the government did stop it. Because I yeah. had a, a, a chief of police over in, I don't know, well, I ain't going to say where. But he yeah. was going around to restaurants and he was converting it. And yeah. uh, th and they told him, uh, as long as you come get it, because a lot of the restaurants has a container out back where they would dump the all grease. restaurants. Yep, right. all restaurants. And, and they would pay a company to come get the, the these containers and empty them yep. or replace them. Yep. And he had to buy a pump that, that I forgot how many gallons per minute and it had to... Well, you know what I'm talking about yeah. to get the grease out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and it actually saved a couple of, uh, um, uh, I ain't gonna say what franchises, some money. And he yeah. was running his Ford diesel truck off of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, if you know how to do it, you, you can straight up convert it to biodiesel without, you know, if you know the process. Absolutely. Mm hmm. But again, then, then the people aren't getting their money, and it's no longer government regulated. And heaven forbid if that doesn't happen, you know right. what I mean? Like, Taxable. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. They yeah. don't care yeah. two cents, you know. Yeah. It ain't gonna happen. <laughs> See, Norma uh, says uh, Decker, my neighbor, has an old diesel Mercedes. Yeah. Collects the neighbor a uh, hood, uses cooking oil, and filters it, and uses it. See. Hi, Norma. Yep. Welcome to the show. Hopefully you're feeling a little bit better, but yeah, but uh, I know because, uh, like I said, he did it, and a lot of people did it in in Southern yeah. Indiana. Uh, a lot of the country folks did it because uh, yep. the restaurants loved it. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you want to see one of them, uh, that thing that uh, Justin was talking about the, the firewood, you know, in the back of the truck. Uh, the yeah, wood 
Mountain Man on the History Channel, Eustace, the guy Eustace, I don't know if you guys watched that show or not, uh, he had one in the back of his truck, a cold you know, yeah. barrel, and he just burnt so much wood at a time, and, and it would run, <laughs> flip me out, <laughs> but it worked. You yep. just gotta know what you're doing. Yep. Um, oh, man, that's some good guys. I've met them a few times. They're some good, they're good guys. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll change well, let's, right un here. let's end full circle on this. All right, so we're talking about um, information that's no longer out there that we used to be able to find, right? Okay. So right, I remember right, right. I remember there was a website that I came across, and it was full of awesome, crazy, conspiracy, wild information. I absolutely loved it, man. One of the things they talked about was some kind of contraption, and they had the design on how to build it and everything that you, you would build and put in the motor of your vehicle. And the longer you had it in there, the more you used it, eventually it kind of like charged up your car where you didn't have to use gas in it anymore. It was oh, some kind I remember of, that. Oh, wow. It was some kind of water-based device and it had a coil yeah. system in it. You remember that? And you could yeah. put it in your car. The more you used it, the more... I don't even understand how it worked, but apparently you used it often enough. Eventually, you could use your car with no gasoline, and this device would power your whole vehicle. Do you remember that? Yes. I, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, but I, you yes. can't find that anymore. Yes, and they had another device. They you put it between your air filter and your manifold, and it looked like a turbo. And, uh -huh. it, and it, it improved your gas mileage up to 40%. And they yep. had it on the market for like a year, and it just totally disappeared. It vanished. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, it, and I, don't, I don't remember what it was called, but it was advertised, and everybody was – and it just and it just went it went gone. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I don't – I can't remember what that was called either. So mm – -hmm. This is what Wait. we said, damn you, Chris. <laughs> well, you, remember, well, you remember what happened when the guy invented a car, a motor that would run off of water, and he drove it from New York or from the East Coast to the West Coast to prove it worked. Guess what? He disappeared. All the plans yep. disappeared. But well, now I seen on uh, TikTok or YouTube or TikTok the other day, there's a guy over in uh, a scientist over in uh, India who has now figured it out himself, and now he's you know trying to oh, get a patent. And, and, uh, yeah, he'll probably disappear too. But I actually seen him put water, you know, where where you put gas in the gas tank. And he told the guy to start, and it started right up. I mean, unless he was using kerosene, it was clear, you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember hearing the story of a guy who was an HVAC tech. He'd been an HVAC tech for years and years, and he took his knowledge of how HVAC systems work and built a carburetor for mm -hmm. a vehicle, and it would the carburetor would make it where you got like 400 miles to the gallon. Oh, my gosh, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? Right? <laughs> and when he went to patent it, a major motor vehicle company from Detroit, I won't mention its name, went to buy the patent off this guy, and the guy refused to sell it. Right. He refused to right. sell it because he's going, no, this needs to be for everybody. If you buy it, you're just going to suppress it. Well, this guy kind of disappeared, too. And nobody ever heard from him after that either. Right. Yeah. That's that's a shame. Okay, so I mean, Brian so Brian found one of them. The one I'm talking about. It's called the Turbinator. Turbinator. He just found a picture. There you go. So yeah. yes. I mean, there was so a lot of going stuff. back, like trying to find this information again. Like people say once it's on the internet, it's always on the internet. You you know. Careful what you put on there is always going to be there. You could bull crap because I have right. looked and look for some of this stuff, and you, you just can't it. find it anymore. No, no, no. 
There's a and lot. I, I mean, there's a lot of smart people out there that have figured this stuff out. Yeah, I could just imagine what they do, what they have figured out, and haven't told anybody because they're scared of what would happen to them. You know right. what I mean? Right. Now, I think mm -hmm. on the Turbinator. Uh, I think the reason, uh, if I recall correctly, Nicole, and if you can ask your husband and Brian, I think the reason why they took that off the market, allegedly, they had a problem with it cracking all the time. That's what they said. I don't believe okay. that. I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it cut into the, the oil refinery. I think it cut into people's taxes and the government. Mm -hmm. or G, I got to say, G-Man. G-Man. So, <laughs> yes, G-Man. <laughs> but I, I think that's why I got pulled, allegedly. But yes. Yeah, make sense. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. like... This website, man, I wish I could remember what it was. It was so much great material out there. It was, they, I mean, they were people talking about the, the, remember the big satanic scare in the 80s where everything was all Satan, Satanistic cults and child sacrifices. And now they mm -hmm. say that never yeah. happened. They say that was just mass hysteria and all this kind of stuff. But th this had article after article from survivors, from people that were involved and got out of it and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, it had plans on, on how to build a device that you could put by cell phone towers that supposedly negated the negative energy coming off cell phone towers. And so he was like compiling this army of people to build these devices and go find all the cell phone towers and then <laughs> place these devices at the bottom of the towers. And you'd have people checking in going, all right, I put my device here. I put my device there. And it was just an absolutely amazing website with all kinds of amazing underground information. And, and I wish it was still around today because I know it's not there anymore. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, right. So much cool stuff that, yeah, they talked about that device that would just make your car basically run on, on nothing anymore. It was absolutely insane. Yeah. It's, it's a shame because there are so many things out there that we could do ourselves. Yep. It's it's we, the, it's, they it's it's the old dollar. Yeah. Is what they there want. There you go. Green. I mean, I, I, who was I talking to? I was talking to someone the other day, and we was talking. And you know, all the mom and pop places are going now. We don't have the little, you know, the little markets like we used to when growing up as kids. You know, with like you know the little town store that carried. You didn't have to go to the AMP or you know or. Kroger's uh -huh. or anywhere like that. You could go, you know, just go to the little place right down the street. And it's it's Western all Western Auto. Yep. I, yeah, Western Auto. Yeah. You know, all if you needed something places. at the hardware store, you went to the hardware store. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. You and I remember you know, that. You know, the 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 big dad gets ruined a lot of small Long and tall places. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a shame. And I think by design. Oh, I'm yeah. going to go back to my conspiracy theories, man. I think that's by design because then you can get, you can control the flow of goods. Control the goods, you control the people. Right. You know? I mean, that's, 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 that's the truth. It's, it's, money is the root of all evil, they say. And I. I do believe that. That's for sure. The love of money. Well, yeah. Yep. Yeah, the greed, the greed of it. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's, that's, it just ain't the same place we grew up in, you know. Yeah. Not like it used Tell to be. Tell me about it. <laughs> no. no, it it isn't. It really isn't. No. A lot of things have changed, and. You know, it, it's, it's, it's going to keep changing. There's no telling where it's going to be another 10 or 15 more years. And that's the sad part of it. So, well, just look at it, Ben. Just, just look from the 90s on how much, how advanced we are now. You know, yeah. In the last 20 years or so, you know, hell, yeah. The last 20 years. I right. Mean, how much well, more advanced everything is. Right. Leaps and bounds, man. Right. It's crazy. Leaps and bounds. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, if you go back to, you know, 
JFK, he predicted all this stuff, you know, the technology, how it was going to grow. Well, mm -hmm. if it was for an Eisenhower and his emergency visit in the middle of the night to go to the hangar and meet with the aliens, the silent <laughs> treaty, mm -hmm. you know, we wouldn't have all this technology, I think. But, you know, I, no, I, I don't know anything. I'm just a grizzly mm -hmm. country boy, so. Right. Just well, like, that, uh, and and uh, the whole Tesla episode of all of his information disappearing when he died, supposedly, from natural right. causes. Right. You know, and, and all the Tesla, Tesla tech disappearing because it was free energy and anybody could do it. And, you know, it was pulling energy from the, the world around us. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't leave out Jackie Gleason and Richard Nixon in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm, yeah. I'm not a crook. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They, yeah, they said uh, they said Jackie Gleason was really into it after him and Nixon uh -huh. did whatever they went and did. He really got into the whole UFO alien thing. Oh yeah, and it's it's, oh, yeah. It was, it's amazing. I still th I, I think they're here. I think they've been here. I don't think they've ever. Oh left. yeah. Oh yeah. No, no, no. They're here. They're here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, the universe is balanced with these positives. We're going to see the negatives from mainstream media for sure. Yeah. Norma, I plan on uh, filling my propane and was told it was $5 a gallon. $5 a gallon? What? Wow. I have a $200 gallon Ooh, tank. It was only $1.90. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's a big, big jump. I back no back in Nebraska, I had a big propane tank, and it was a dollar thirty something a gallon back six, seven years ago. And I thought that was crazy expensive. Yeah, I can't remember when I was a kid up on the farm. You know, we had the big propane tank. You know, to heat the house and you know stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I don't ever remember it being like that expensive. I think it was like two hundred dollars to fill up from uh, diesel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, some people did burn that, didn't they, at one time, uh, in, their, mm -hmm. in the furnaces, yeah. Yes, off-road yeah. diesel is what it was called. <laughs> yeah, because you can get that. I think you use it in your tractors now is what they sell. You can buy the off-road diesel. For like, you know, your your farm tractors and stuff. You use the yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even them little torpedo heaters, you know, to heat, you know, a building up or underneath, you know, oh, yeah. your but, you know, they use like all different kerosene off road. They'll burn about anything, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Oh, yeah. yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, Chris did a wonderful job switching it to his show. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, man, that, listen, that's why this show is rabbit holes because we never know where we're going to run, where we're going to end up at. So that's what right. we do. We discuss, the, we, we find something, and we just dive deep, you know, and see where the rabbit hole takes us. And that's exactly what we did tonight. We went down right. some very twisty right. alternate rabbit holes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, I'm glad you really did come on the show, and, and, and I'm very yeah. glad I finally got to meet you for a chance. So I'm um, Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, I, I, yeah, nice to meet you too. Uh, yeah, anytime you guys need somebody, just give me a holler. I don't mind coming on. <laughs> yeah, man, we oh, man, never I know where, where, where our train's gonna go. You can you can tell that right now. So. <laughs> right. We was into everything tonight. You know, as long as uh, Nicole and Norma don't drive, we're not gonna end up in the ditch. So we're okay. But yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I got to tell you the story about that one night. Uh, that 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 story will get you in in tears. So, uh, yeah. But uh, I never forget that story. I I I, I can still hear the other police department cussing me out for doing that to them. But anyway, but uh, it, it's been fun. And and thank you, Chris, yeah. from Country Boy Conversation, for coming no on, and ladies and gentlemen for tuning in. And uh, hopefully everybody have a good night. And from coast to coast and around the world, that's a wrap. Y'all have a good one. All right. And God bless. And God you all next week. Good night. Take everybody. care. Bye-bye.
It's a grizzly. Should we get out of here? No. We're gonna watch and listen. It's a grizzly. Oh, ship, should we run? <laughs> no. Action. It's a grizzly. Oh, shit. should we run? <laughs> okay. It's a grizzly. Are you sure it's not Jim Monk? <laughs> Ah, I got here. <laughs> it's a grizzly. Oh, I'm out of here. Huh? Maybe it is a chipmunk. Oh, it's a grizzly. Oh, it. Are we going to die? I don't know. We're just going to sit here and listen and watch. Let's get out of here, maybe. <laughs> Fall! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>